In the fall of 1939, American preacher who was based in Philadelphia named Donald Gray Barnhouse was one of the three or four best known preachers in the whole world, and he was honoring a long-term commitment he had made to speak at a church in Ireland in September of 1939. And it was the same week, of course all of Europe was extremely tense, it was the same week that the Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain had said that if Hitler, who had invaded Poland that week, did not withdraw from Poland by 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, then Great Britain would declare war. Just as Barnhouse rose from his seat to preach, he was handed a note by the senior minister there that read, no reply from Hitler. The prime minister has declared war. And after handing him the note, he whispered to him as he headed to the stage, I hope you have a good sermon today. It may be the last sermon some of these men here will ever hear. Barnhouse got to the podium and he read as his text, Matthew 24, verse 6 which says, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. If you're reading it in the King James or the New King James, which is what he would have read it in then, it says, but do not be troubled. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. And Barnhouse began to speak to that group of people of whom nearly all the men would be plunged into war within a month by describing the horrors of war. And after each account, he would repeat, but don't be troubled. For instance, he said, millions of homes will be broken up because of this war, but don't be troubled. Children will be torn from their mothers and their fathers, but don't be troubled. Husbands and brothers will die in battle, but don't be troubled. Innocent blood will flow like rivers, but don't be troubled. Children will become orphans, but don't be troubled. And on and on he went for five or ten minutes like that, each time ending by saying, but don't be troubled. Until about ten minutes in, he stopped doing that, and he looked up to the heavens and he said, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Really? He was being gut level honest. And I thought about that story as I was reading through one of my three of the favorite prophets, and that's Habakkuk. My, my personal three favorite prophets are Daniel, Hosea, and Habakkuk, and with, a, with an honorable mention there to Isaiah. But uh, Habakkuk is one of my favorite favorite of the prophets because it sounds like it could have come off of yesterday's news or radio or television show. These kind of words and the kind of situation, spoken in the kind of situation where Barnhouse was speaking them, you have either got to be a madman, absolutely crazy, Or you've got to have an unbelievable trust in God. It's one or the other. Unless Jesus is God, and Jesus is the one that spoke these words, he would have no business telling us, don't be troubled. And of course, as Barnhouse went on to explain, and as we believe, Jesus is God. He is always at the wheel. 
He never dozes off. Though man's sins and greed and pride causes the horrors of war, God still controls human affairs. And he uses horrible times even for his purposes and ultimately in the end he wins over sin. That basically is the short three chapter book of Habakkuk in a nutshell but we got to go through from some stuff to get there. You see the book of Habakkuk is a progression from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3, there's this incredibly different progression going on. He goes from wrestling with God in chapter 1, you will see, to waiting on God in chapter 2 to this extraordinary worship of God in chapter 3. He starts in a valley in chapter 1, and then he literally climbs on top of a wall around the city, as you will see in chapter 2. And then he ends on a spiritual mountaintop in chapter 3. The book of Habakkuk begins with a sob and it ends with a song. It is for everybody who has ever looked at what takes place in the world and says, don't be troubled. Really? Why, God? This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? I remember back in the 80s or 90s, it was one of the top Christian musicians in the world, Michael W. Smith, had a song based on these verses. How long will it be, dear Lord? Lord, you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I'm crying, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? My, must I watch all this misery wherever I look? I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Here is what is perplexing the prophet. Habakkuk was a Jew living in Jerusalem about 600 B.C. Now, I don't know whether it's awfully, it's awfully hard when you go through a series of the prophets like we've been doing to remember timelines. But in 586 B.C. is when the Babylonian conquest of the Jews became final and they took many of them off into exile and they absolutely just took over the whole land. But they had begun raids decades before that. And Habakkuk was living in a time of many of these raids around 600 B.C., about 15 years before the total conquest would happen. And so he would watch a mighty army roll in from the east, the Babylonians unhindered into God's land, and they would plunder the homes of hardworking families, and they would keep hold much of Judah under military occupation. It's very similar in a degree to what's going on right now in the world, where a few years ago, Russia and Putin invaded Crimea and took a part of what was the UK and Crimea and then another little section in addition to that and then came back later and raided even more fully with the hope of taking the entire country. But it's hard for us to understand that happening back in 600 BC. And it's even a little hard for us to understand that happening across the world right now as it is happening. So let me try to illustrate it for you this way. What if Mexico were a much stronger country militarily and economically than the United States was? And what if Mexico suddenly without any provocation from the United States 
crossed our border, invaded our cities, and helped themselves to our land and our houses and our streets and our businesses and our economy and everything else. And suddenly we couldn't even move about without Mexican permission. Freedom had vanished. Our laws would be irrelevant. Would you scream for justice? Would you complain to God? Probably. Probably. And that's what Habakkuk is doing here when he says, how long, O Lord, are we going to have to go through this? How long must I call for help? Why must I watch all this misery? Because he was pointing out to God what many of us have often thought and what is the absolute truth. Life isn't fair. By the way, God never said it was. The Bible never says it was. Life isn't fair. One day life just reaches up and slaps you in the face with inequality and injustice. And there's not much, if anything, you can do about it. And if you haven't experienced that yet, someday, I guarantee you, you will. But what adds to the prophet's frustration is God's apparent complicity in the whole matter. Habakkuk screams and God refuses to answer. That's what he says. He's bothered by the fact that God isn't doing anything to restore right and wrong. When will God punish the wicked and reward and protect the righteous? When will God make right what has been wronged? And so the Lord finally replies. Look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I'm doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't even believe even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians a cruel and violent people, they will march across the world and conquer other lands. Whoa, wait a minute. That's not the answer Habakkuk was expecting. Habakkuk thought God was just asleep. God was just inactive. God just didn't care. When actually just the opposite was true, God was behind it. God was doing it. This isn't because life isn't fair. Some things are. But this isn't one of those times. This is God behind it. I am raising up the Babylonians to conquer you. And so Habakkuk now, is, he's not any better, he's worse. He first thought God was just asleep, wasn't paying any attention. But now he realizes God is using a sinful nation, the most sinful of all, as his own agents and angels. It was much easier to accept that God had fallen asleep at the wheel, how much harder is it to accept that God is behind it all and that this is even his doing? Why, why would a holy God use an unholy and wicked people like this? Hey, I get that. Don't you? And God's actions were neither understood nor appreciated by Habakkuk. As God himself said, I'm doing something you wouldn't believe even if somebody told you about it. He was working in a way nobody could possibly even imagine. And here's our problem, okay? We make assumptions in our dealings with God. We want God to work, but in our way, 
at our time, according to our plan, to carry out our agenda. And when God doesn't, our faith is tested. So here is one of the first important things we have to all deal with when reading the book of Habakkuk. Do you trust God's way and God's wisdom even when it completely contradicts your own? See, seldom does faith see all that God is doing. He works behind the scenes. The facts that we have are not always understood. At times we see what God is up to, but we don't like it. But faith still trusts God even then. Never in a million years would Habakkuk have thought that God would use an evil and idolatrous people like the Babylonians. Now, we're not going to take time to read it, but most of the rest of chapter 1 describes why the Babylonians were the least likely nation to be used as God's instrument. They were as vile and vicious and violent as you could get. They completely lacked any kind of morality and dignity. They were cruel. And God's reply to Habakkuk about that, again, causes more questions than it gives answers. <laughs> oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, you are eternal. Surely you do not plan to wipe us out. O oh Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins, but you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? That's a pretty good question. Habakkuk knew that God's people had sinned and needed to be judged, but by the Babylonians? They were way worse than the people that they were sent to torture. Yes, God's people had sinned, but compared to the Babylonians, they were saints. Have you ever been in Habakkuk's place? Have you ever wrestled with God? Hey, I have. I don't know whether you have or not, but I know I have. I have dealt with every, over f nearly 50 years of preaching now, every form of tragedy imaginable. I could tell you stories that would make your skin crawl. I have seen things that I wouldn't have thought anybody could ever see, like a back of growth. And I struggled with it. And I've asked, God, why this person? God, why this situation? God, why that? I mean, I saw something and went through and experienced something two or three years ago here that I'm, I'm still a little shaken by that happened in someone's life. And I back it. He's wrestling, he's struggling with that. God's at work, but he's not running the world. Habakkuk would expect a holy God should run his world. And so chapter 2 starts with Habakkuk doing something very interesting. It says, Habakkuk will climb up to his watchtower and stand at his guard post, and there I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. <laughs> I love that. Let me ask, what do you do when your life doesn't make sense? When, when your conclusions are really just nothing but confusion. When life goes haywire and you can't square the horrible circumstances in your life with a God who loves and cares for you. And you have a choice then. You live by faith or you don't. It's, it's as simple as that. We're going to get there in another verse or two. You live by faith or you don't. You live by faith or you don't. You can jump to conclusions. God let me down. 
God doesn't care. God's hands were tied. There was nothing he could do about it. God took the day off. He's asleep, like a back at first thought. God may be doing this to me on purpose. That's the hardest thing to believe of all. And you can jump to conclusions, probably wrong conclusions because we're human. Or you can climb to the right perspective. And so I love this. Habakkuk ascended to the top of Jerusalem's walls. You see, the walls of an ancient city were strong and thick, and, a, and along the wall, it was also a road. So the walls were built to protect the city, all the way around the city, and then at the top of the walls was also a road that you could travel by horse. And so these were towers, guard post towers, lookouts, combat positions, where soldiers could go to to watch for an invasion. Walls were a vantage point in climbing to the top of the tower of the walls. Habakkuk was rising above the circumstances of all the perplexing things that was happening and saying, I'm going to look for you and wait and not draw any more conclusions. I'm just going to wait, see how you'll answer my complaint. You see, when life throws you a curve, and some of you it has thrown a really big curve, you can jump or you can climb. You can jump to faulty conclusions or you can climb to see the glory of God. Habakkuk chose the latter literally. <laughs> and notice his determination. There I will wait. Uh, the NLV, I believe, uh, NIV, I believe, says there I will watch and wait. There or stand and wait. Another translation says, there I will stand or watch or wait. Now that implies he's not coming down until he hears from God. He is not coming down until he hears from God. You remember Moses fasted for 40 days before God spoke to him? Do you remember Daniel prayed for three weeks before an angel broke through and the victory was won? Why is it that we pray for three or four minutes and if we don't get an answer, we just flip on Netflix or call a friend? When you seek God, show a little determination for God's sake. Habakkuk climbs up on top of the walls, away from the hustle and bustle in the streets, away from what people are saying, ditches all the distractions and gets alone with God. Up there, there was no ceiling between him and God to quieten his soul and listen to what the Spirit of God may say to him in answering his complaint. What are, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you listening for? Waiting to hear from God? True story about a Native American who once left a reservation in South Dakota to go visit one of his good friends in New York City, and he and his friend were walking down a busy street when suddenly the Native American stopped and said, I hear a cricket. His buddy who had lived in New York City for several years said, that is impossible. Nobody could possibly hear a cricket with all the shouts and buses and taxis and cars and ambulances and pedestrians. But the Native American insisted, I hear a cricket. He walked over to a planter bed next to an entranceway, dug just a little bit into the dirt, and pulled out a cricket. His friend said, how in the world did you hear a cricket in the midst of all this noise? The Native American said, it's all in how you train your ear, what you're used to, and what you're prepared to hear. He reached into his pocket and he pulled out 
a bunch of coins, quarters and dimes and nickels, and he tossed them onto the sidewalk, and everybody around stopped in New York and looked. They all recognized that sound. We hear what we train ourselves to hear. We see what we prepare ourselves to see. That is why Habakkuk climbed on top of the wall, sought out a quiet place to listen for the Lord. And he says, I want to know how he will answer my complaint. Now understand, Habakkuk expected to be corrected. Maybe that is why so many people really don't take the time to listen to God. They don't want to be told what to do or think. They don't want to be corrected. When I approach God, I have to always understand He is the teacher, I am the student. Not once ever have I enlightened God on a subject or situation. Not once have I ever told God something He didn't already know. God corrects, not us. So he's going to wait there, and we don't know how long he waits there, but the Lord finally begins his answer. The Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Before we see what he told him to write, let me just pull over there and park a minute and say, God's will will come to pass. It may take a while because a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day with the Lord, as the Bible says. You don't always reap in the same season that you sow. That's why we need faith and patience to inherit God's promises. God shows us his plan, but it's not Oof, presto, there it is for you. It doesn't always happen just instantly. The vision God sets before us and our hearts may take time. Sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it may take years to unfold and come together. And during that time, it takes faith and endurance to hang on long enough to see Division. What comes next in verse 4 is, by all acclaim, one of the greatest verses in all the Bible. I'm going to explain to you just how great it is in just a minute. That's why I've put it up in three different translations. If you're reading in the NLT, which is what I use most of the time, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. The NIV says, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. I grew up memorizing the King James Version, so I've had this memorized for so many years. The just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. What a vital vision. Now, if you don't listen to anything else I say, listen to the next minute or two. Habakkuk had been living by sight. He couldn't see God's hand in anything that was happening. He had been living by logic. What God was doing didn't make any sense to him at all. He had been living by emotion. He just screamed out in frustration in the very first verse of his words. How long, oh God, will this keep going on? I, probably like you, almost always live by those same three traits. How many decisions did I make that are based on sight, logic, and emotion. Most people today, and this is a frightening thing for the future, most people today live by their emotions. 
I have always mostly lived by logic and reason. I am very, very, like many of you, left-brained. I have very little right brain in me. I'm not even sure the right part of the brain is there. I am very left-brained. I live by logic and reason, for the, and I see things that way for the most part. Most people live either by sight or logic or emotion. So was a backup doing that. But the just shall live by faith. Way different. Way different to live by faith and not by sight or logic or emotion. And that's why back at 2 4 is one of the most strategic verses in the Bible. In the third century AD, a Jewish rabbi named Simlai observed that Moses gave Israel 613 commandments, 365 were negative, and 248 were positive. And he noted that in Psalm 15, David reduced those commandments from 613 to 11. If you read Psalm 15, you'll see pretty carefully why he says that. That in Isaiah chapter 33, Isaiah reduced those 11 commands further to six. And you remember a week or two ago when we were studying the prophet Micah, Micah compresses them down to three to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. But Habakkuk takes the final step and takes it all the way down to one. The righteous or the just live by faith. This verse is so important. It revolutionized the life of the Apostle Paul. Paul quoted Habakkuk 2, 4 three times. In Romans 1, 17, in Galatians 3, 11, and if he wrote Hebrews, in Hebrews 10, 38. That's how important this verse is. When we are tempted to live by sight or logic or emotion like we almost always are, we have to remember we walk by faith and not by sight, the New Testament says, and the just lives by faith. Now, we don't have the time to read in the middle part of chapter 2 the five condemnations that then are pronounced against the king of Babylon because he's going to get his too, is what God tells Habakkuk here. The king of Babylon, it's going to look like he's in control for today, but wait till tomorrow's coming. He's going to get his too. And God closes his curses on the king by, in, in verse 20 by saying, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. i got to pull over here and park just a minute because what this verse is saying is King Nebuchadnezzar, who was going to conquer, uh, uh, conquer Judah, chased after false gods while the true God is actually abiding in his temple. And, and I've always just disliked this song. I was telling Tim this week, I, I've... I have never put this song in a worship program since I was in my 20s probably because it, it occurred to me very early on that this song, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him, keep silence, keep silence before him, you know. This song, the way it always was presented and interpreted in the churches that I grew up was, we have to be quiet. God is in his holy temple. So we can't have any chaos or confusion in the church combining this passage with 1 Corinthians chapter 14. For God is not the author of confusion but of peace. The Lord's in his holy temple at all the God. No, the Lord is not in this temple. We are the temple of God. We're living under the New Testament grace, not under Old Testament law. That verse is, so, the way that, is, that song has often been used is so out of context, has absolutely nothing to do with the meaning we have often attached to it. It was used to justify being solemn when we enter the church building in New Testament worship, and that is completely out of its context and its true meaning, has nothing to do with it. But 
I'll end that rant only because of time. Chapter 3 begins, have you ever seen this before? Have you ever done this before? This prayer was sung by the prophet Habakkuk. You ever sung a prayer? I was thinking while I was studying this, maybe we ought to try that, singing a prayer. Maybe Sunday morning we should tell the person who leads the closing prayer up here, sing it. What melody? I don't know. Just pick one. Sing it to I do anything for love, but I don't do that or whatever. Sing it. I love that thought. The prayer was sung. By the way, the Hebrews did that a lot. And verse 2 articulates what he's saying. I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works in this time of our deep need. Help us again as you did in years gone by and in your anger. Remember your mercy. Wouldn't you just love to see Habakkuk sitting on top of that watchtower, getting that message back from God, and as a result of God answering him, singing this prayer? You know why I love Habakkuk so much now? Why it's in my top three? Habakkuk first heard God's plan, he was alarmed, and now he so trusts God's ways are right that he sings this beautiful prayer. Verses 3 through 6 is a reference to both past judgments and judgments to come. Habakkuk said, I see God moving across the deserts from Edom, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens and the earth is filled with his praise. He is coming as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plague follows close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. Who is it that can level eternal hills? The eternal one. He is the eternal one. Let me narrow this down for you, what this is all saying. In the end, God wins. It may not always seem like that today or tomorrow, but in the end, God wins. Life is a little bit like a suspense novel. The tension builds and builds until you have to flip to the final chapter to discover how the plot ends. And after you read it, you can then go back and enjoy the story without all the anxiety. I, I've had to do that a few times. I had to do it Sunday watching the Dolphins playoff game. I was so sleepy Sunday that I, uh, that I at halftime, I recorded the game, and I thought, well, the Dolphins are going to lose anyway. And then I, and then, so I took a nap, and then I got back up, and I was watching. And it was so intense and so exciting, I had to flip to the end. Or I couldn't even watch through it, the third and fourth quarters. I had to flip all the way through it and get to the end to see what happened. And then I wished I hadn't. But anyway, that's what it's talking about here. That's the way life is. Sometimes you have to go to the end, and I can tell you what the end says. The end says... What the end of the book of Habakkuk says, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. That's living by faith, not by sight or logic or emotion. 